it's good to be back here with y'all. And uh, I'm very sorry that Stephen is stuck in an airport. But um, anyway, it's always good to be, to be here with y'all. Uh, the last day of July, so August is coming up. So I'm sorry for those of you who have August birthdays, but I just want to get right through August and get to September. I love fall. Fall is my favorite time of year, so this is a happy time for me. But anyway, uh, we're going to get into Amos again uh, today. And before we do that, I want to say how impressed I am with y'all and with Stephen for uh, going through a tough book and, uh, and seeking out the full counsel of God's Word and not just the happy stuff. You know, sometimes we need a little bit of the whole thing, right? And so kudos to you, those, for going through this. And uh, you got two more weeks, and it ends on a happy note. So just hang in there, because uh, as a matter of fact, the early church saw the last chapter of Amos as very important for making a huge decision in moving forward. With the, You read about that in Acts, I'm sure Stephen will refer to that. But Amos is, uh, is a big deal for the early church and, uh, and a big deal for us today. So... Uh, Let's try and get into chapter 7. And once again, Stephen gives me the, the fun ones. But this one's, this one's going to be tough. We're going to make it. We're going to get through it. But let me say a quick word and we'll go. Blessed Father, I pray that you would watch over this time. I pray, Lord, you would speak powerfully to us through your word. And all these things, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's look at chapter 7. There's a, just a handful of things that I want to, to look at here. But... Um, the scholars, the, the kind of the, the stuff that I was reading as I was, you know, looking through and preparing and, um, you know, studying for the book stuff, um, there's a, possibly a break in time between chapter 6 and chapter 7, or this may have been one continuous uh, message, not sure, but um, it, uh, it's, in 7, he kind of starts to take a break, and we have a series of visions. So there's going to be a few of them in, uh, in 7, 8, and 9, um, and you'll see those later. But there's going to be three of them we'll look at here uh, right now. Uh, two of them are similar. The third one is not. So let's take a look at those real quick. And just read with me if you would. Let's just start right here in Amos chapter 7, verse 1. I'm reading for the English Standard Version. So, um, here we go. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And when they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, O Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling for a judgment by fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. Then I said, O oh Lord God, please cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. Okay, we'll pick up the third vision in just a second. But there's a, a couple of things I want to point out um, here. Um, God is giving Amos some pretty terrifying images, visions of what could be. This is, these are possibilities. God could do this. So uh, one of them, um, one of them is concerning a, a locust plague. We've heard about that before, and another one is concerning uh, great drought and fire that uh, that uh, produces great famine and hardship. So you've got those two things that would be natural in their <coughs> in their effect. Um, but here's something that's interesting to me. Amos says two things in here. He repeats them. He says, Oh Lord, 
One, he says, please forgive. And then two, he says, please cease. But I want to get to that in a second. He says, Jacob is so small. He can't make it. And here's the deal. You guys know this. I'm going through here. Jeroboam II was the king. This was kind of a high point. Economically, militarily, as a nation. The uh, surrounding nations had kind of fallen into internal struggles and strife with Assyria and, and Egypt and Babylon. So uh, Judah was able to kind of grow a little bit, spread out, retake territories, reestablish trade routes. There's a lot of good stuff going on, you know, if you want to look at it from one, one perspective. They're in Judah. They would not have said... We are so small. They would have said, look at us. Right? If you remember uh, last week, looking in in chapter 6, they had ivory couches, they had paneled homes. It was nice. Right? (laughs) It was nice from their perspective. How they acquired all of that was repulsive to God, and it bred a culture that was uh, putting them at enemies, uh, as enemies with God, but interesting, Amos said this, he says, oh Lord God, please forgive, please stop, how can Jacob stand, he's so small, Amos's perspective was different, and this is something that I read in a in a commentary, allow me to read this to you real quick. He says, Amos appeals to the nation's smallness. It seems incongruous that he should do this in view of the vast holdings and affluence of the northern kingdom of the 8th century B.C. The nation must have seemed small, however, in view of the devastating plague he witnessed in the vision. Sometimes adversity places things in their proper perspective. Amos looked at the bright, shining towers, buildings, affluence. He saw the same thing they did. But compared to the devastating judgment that was possible from God over the poisonous culture that they had built, they weren't going to make it. Amos sized them up according to God's ability and righteousness as opposed to everything they had built with their hands, right? It's a whole different perspective. And for him to measure things up that way shows that Amos is coming from a very different view than they were. And I think that's something that really stuck out to me. Sometimes adversity places things in their proper perspective. So, you know, I can think back. I mean, poor old Stephen stuck in an airport. I mean, that's kind of adversity. But you can look back and, and see, I can see times where maybe I had, um, had the wrong perspective, was pursuing the wrong thing in a relationship with a job, with a... Uh, something that, whatever it was, that I was maybe kind of even building up into an idol, to be honest with you. And it had to be met with some adversity, maybe, for me to get the right perspective. Because I was going in the wrong direction. And I wasn't listening when things were good. (laughs) I was listening a little bit better when it got rough. Right? Sometimes, God allows those things. Now, this is a a broken, sinful world, and so, you know, sin mars everything. But sometimes, God will allow adversity. Now, this is judgment that we're talking about in Amos. So it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. Not exactly adversity, but I want to look at one verse that really spoke to me that I think we can apply in here to Amos. But uh, real quick, I'm going to look at Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 6. You guys may know where I'm going with this. Hebrews 12, verse 6. 
And I'm going to read just a little bit here. You can read along with me if you'd like, or I can just read. But this helps me get a proper perspective sometimes. We'll just start in six. Now, he starts off with a quote from Proverbs. So you've got to know your Old Testament. Here we go. So, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And then he goes on and says this. It is for discipline that you have come to endure. Um, God is treating you as sons. For what son is there when his father does not, whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Okay? That one's not easy to hear, but it's a good one to hear. And I think some of that is underneath the message of Amos. As hard as Amos can be, it is the love of God for his sons and daughters that powers every word of Amos. Okay? Let's keep going here. All right? Let's keep going. Um, yeah, we just did that. Let's look at this real quick. Um, so one, Amos has the right perspective. Two, <laughs> as nasty as these people were, Amos still pleaded with God on their behalf. I mean, how many weeks have y'all been going through this? These people were off, right? They were wounding each other. They had a poisonous culture. It was dark. Amos was going into a place that may have cost him his life to say what he said. It's like that, right? Still, when God presented Amos with two visions of what could come because of their sin and the righteous judgment of God, Amos said, please forgive them. Please don't do this. Conviction, okay? Because I got people in my life, you may have people in your life that wear you out out right you know they are going down the wrong path and they just keep going keep going keep going and all you want to do is say when you straighten up come back and then we'll talk right as awful as these people were God's people Amos said please I beg you, don't do this. That convicts me. I've got family members I don't do that for. Yeah. You see the heart of Amos? You see the perspective of Amos? Let's keep going. So we've got those two visions. Now we're about to have a third. Here we go. Ready? Verse 7. This is what the Lord showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will never again pass by them. You may have a different translation. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise against the house of Jeroboam 
with the sword. Ooh. You know where Amos is, right? He's in the kingdom of Jeroboam. <laughs> He's in Bethel, right? Wow, this guy's pretty bold. All right, but let's look at this. Okay, there's a couple things I want to point out here as I was digging into this. There's a bit of a controversy among biblical scholars as to how to interpret this passage. So here's a fun one. There's a phrase called <laughs> hapex legomena. There you go. If I said it wrong, ask Stephen. He'll say it right to it. That's a, a term that scholars use for words that are only used once in the Bible. Just once. And so they don't have a comparable usage elsewhere in Scripture. So what scholars have to do is look at how that word is used extra-biblically or how it's used in its context in order to interpret what it means. So you probably all have plumb line in your Bible. Does anyone have something different? You know? Well, I learned this. So actually, that's one of those words that's only used once in the Bible. So it says, um, uh, Behold, the Lord was standing beside a, a wall built with a plumb line. So, literally that word is tin. Excuse me, tin. T-I-N. Uh, it's a word uh, that is not Hebrew. It's a word that's found in the Assyrian language. Hello, he's looking forward to something. That language is called Akkadian. And the word, uh, let's see, yeah, I wrote it down somewhere. I couldn't pronounce it anyway. But it literally uh, either means tin or lead. But the more that they have looked into um, uh, extra biblical stuff, the more they say it's not lead. We see that used everywhere, it's tin. So it's a kind of a metal. So literally, he might be saying a wall of tin and not a plumb line. So I'm going to consider both of those as we go through this because this is something scholars are debating currently. Okay? So the reason why they would use plumb line is because it fits a little bit the context of the passage. He had something in his hand, and it was metal. And so that is used elsewhere in Isaiah. It's used elsewhere in um, Ezekiel and things like that. A plumb line is a, is a feature that we see a lot in Scripture. And so when you see that, what is a plumb line? Has anyone ever built a wall? Built a brick? Come on, we got some hands back here. You know the deal. So you have a rope, right? And then you would have a weight at the bottom of it. And the gravity would pull that rope straight. So you, you look at how the wall is built according to the plumb line. So the foundation may be great, but it might have been built over time in a way that gets off plumb. Right? So what do you do? You got to take it down. It must be dismantled brick by brick. Right? There's an Exxon gas station that's kind of near where my mom lives. And they've been building that thing up, and they built the whole front of it. And we're like, ooh, they're about to open the gas station. Two days later, there were guys up there, and they took every brick down, brick by brick. Now, I don't know why, but it's kind of like that. There's just no fixing it. You can't, you know, okay, you know, it's got to come down. So that image fits the passage contextually. Because the people had built up their culture in such a way, it was off. And you start stacking stuff on top of that, it's going to, it's just not going to hold. So that image fits. So uh, real briefly, we could talk about this one all day. But when you talk about the plumb line of God, what is that? The easiest, or the one that fits the most is the righteousness of God. That's bound up in his character. So that's what is, he is comparing things to, is his righteousness. And as you have seen over the weeks prior, they weren't doing 
<laughs> so well according to that measurement, right? So it's a, it's a convicting question. So if God were to put that plumb line in my relationships and how I do business in my church life, if God were to put that plumb line, how's that going? Am I building pretty steady on a good foundation? Foundation may be good. How am I building on it? Brick by brick. That's a good question. And that may be what Amos is talking about here. If he is talking about a wall of tin, which sounds weird, but um, it's actually, um, that kind of imagery is used elsewhere in Scripture. There's one in Jeremiah 15.20. We won't turn to it. But God says that if his people would return to him in full faith, he would make them like a wall of bronze to their enemies, to those who would oppose them. So yeah, you think of this big wall and you got soldiers behind it and they're advancing. Well, you can shoot arrows at that thing all day long. They're going to bounce right off. They're going to advance. There's a wall of bronze before them, okay? So there's imagery there, but it's always military. Okay? And then you also have in Ezekiel 4, 3, that poor guy. You want to read a book and say, thank you, Lord, I'm not Ezekiel? Read that one. Poor fella. But he had to lay on his side for a year, something like that, and use a little, an iron griddle, using to make food, stand it up next to you like an iron wall is what God said. So it's a picture of military invasion. Okay, so you have that imagery. So both could fit. Sorry I'm kind of belaboring this, but I want to make sure we look at both in case in the future we have um, uh, differing texts, right? Depending on how they interpret that. However, um, you look at that, the end result is the same. The people didn't listen, and the Assyrians came in and destroyed the city of Samaria, okay, in the northern kingdom. So both of those fit. All right, there you go on that. Um, difficult, difficult word, but we've got to look at it here. He says this. Behold, I'm setting a plumb line or a wall of tin. In the midst of my people Israel, I will never again pass by them. Okay, tough one. So you may have something else in your Bible that may say, show mercy, or something of that effect. So it seems that up until this time, God had in his grace, in his mercy, and all of those things, been able to overlook Offense, overlook offense, forgive, overlook offense. And that is his character to do. Praise God. It seems as though things had risen to such a level in Amos' day to where God has said, I will do that no more. That's a tough one to read. That's a tough one to read. But... It gives us a sense of how things had gone and how things could go if we keep pursuing it. But God's saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. We're going we're to talk about this one. <laughs> right? So that's where we are in Amos with that third vision, which is difficult. Uh, and it ends with, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Oh, boy. We got specific. So now we're talking about Jeroboam. How's that going to work out? Well, let's talk about it. Keep going. Look at verse. Uh, look at next verse, verse ten. Remember where he is. He's in Bethel. He is in the religious center of the northern kingdom, and Jeroboam is right there. Okay, here we go. Jeroboam the second. Here we go. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam the priest now. To Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. 
And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Okay, well, I didn't go over so well. Let's look at this. Amos says what he says, and it begins to sound to Amaziah like a political statement, right? We brought the king into it. Here's the deal. This was a question of authority. Right? This is the high priest. Corrupted, yes, but they still allowed God to be a part of their religion there. It was a question of authority. Here's the thing. Conflict between Amos and Azariah was inevitable since their loyalties were in conflict. Right? This, this one really sticks out to me because, boy, oh boy, do we have a divided political culture today. I mean, it's like one side or the other side, and there's no in-between. And we're always shooting at each other politically, right? In our, in our words, in our news cycle, whatever. But this is a message from God. And Amaziah is interpreting it as a political statement that has to be squashed. He is seeing it uh, according to his authority and his loyalty. His authority is the king, not God Almighty. And he's a priest. Okay? His authority is the king, and his loyalty is to the king's court, not God. And he's a priest. Right? There are some things that we talk about today that shouldn't have a political left or right that are found in the Word of God, but boy, oh boy, they do. They'll divide people right up, left or right, even when we're talking about things that are firmly rooted in Scripture. It's a question of authority and loyalty. So the, the, the priest says this. He says, O oh, seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat your bread there. You may have a different translation. Make your money over there. He assumed he was getting paid. He assumed somebody had sent him from the rival political party up here to bash this political party. He assumed he was getting paid. And he insulted him. Now, when you say prophesy or preach, that word can, um, it really comes from the Hebrew for drip. So it means to drip, um, like honey or, or juice or something. It, was, it can often be a positive thing, to drip, is what they use. Well, it wasn't positive here. <laughs> you can go drip that stuff down there, but quit your dripping up here. We don't want to hear it. Because he didn't interpret it as God's word. He interpreted it according to his political affiliations. All right? That's just bad news. That's bad news. You go, you go drip down there. And oh boy, oh boy. Amos. I love this guy. Amos. How does he respond? This is the heights of power. How does he respond? And Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son. Now there is a prophetic class who is employed by the king or by the religious establishment in that day. Yes, there was. He wasn't part of it. He was not paid. This was not a political action committee that sent him to the northern kingdom, right? He was not paid. He was sent. Here we go. 
I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. He's a farmer. But the Lord took me from following the flocks, and the Lord said to me, Go, you drip. (laughs) You prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Oh, boy. Okay, we're going to get into it. We're just going to read it because it's in the Bible, okay? So we're going to read it. Um, Consequences here. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel. Do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword. And your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. And you yourself shall die in an unclean land. And Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. Gosh. Okay. Let's get this right, okay? Amos is not saying, because you did this, God's going to do this. He wouldn't say, well, because you said that, God's going to do this to your family. That's not what's happening here. What Amos is doing is revealing to these people what's coming. The whole book of Amos is seek me and live, right? Amos 5, and warning them of what was coming if things didn't change. What was coming was the brutality of war. The very nation that they were snuggling up to and patterning themselves after Assyria is the very one that's going to wipe them out. It is the love of God that is telling them, stop this. Seek me and live. What is coming is awful. So what we see is the horrors and the brutalities of war, which is um, the future, because we don't want to hear what God's saying. We're not interested. We've got this. Look at my house, right? We got this. Mm. Didn't turn out so great, and we can see that historically. All right, I'm going to wrap up with this last little bit. <laughs> Let's just read it. Here we go. Let's look at eight. Look at eight. We're going to go into a couple of verses here. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never pass I will never again pass by them. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day. So many bodies, they are thrown everywhere. Silence. Wow. Okay. Amos is using everything he's got. God is speaking as powerfully as he can to warn them. This is what you are marching toward. It is a race to your ruin. Stop. Okay? That's Amos' message. Why? Because God loves them. Okay? That's it. That's got to be behind everything. So when we hear, when we read things like this that are difficult, Um, to look at and to even contemplate, understand that it is the love of a gracious and compassionate God who warns us if we are going in the wrong direction because he knows where that's going to lead. He knows. And he loves us too much to just sit back and let us go there. Right? That's Amos. I hope you see that in Amos. As difficult as it can be, 
It is the love of a compassionate God for his wayward people that powers every word of it. Okay? Now then, you got eight and nine to go, so just do that next time. But it ends up well. But that's part of his message. And uh, anyway, I hope that was... Uh, it's, you have to, like, you know, continue, to be continued. So next week will be to be continued, but it, it picks up from there. But anyway, I hope that uh, what we can see in this difficult, hard-to-read chapter in the Bible is the love of God calling out to his wayward people, return to him, and find favor and peace and blessing. Okay? All right. That's a tough one. Thank you, Stephen, one more time for that. <laughs> Okay, let me close it with a word of prayer. Blessed Father, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for loving us like you do. I thank you for your compassion you showed us through Jesus. For sending your only Son to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Your love is unfathomable. And we stand in awe of it with thanks and our hearts open to you this morning. I pray for everyone here. I pray for their uh, families and for their homes. I pray for your great blessing and your peace to be on them. Help us, Lord, to make decisions that we need to make to follow you this day in peace. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.